Okay, we, we heard a lot about the machine, the collaborations, what not, uh, sign up for the users group and all that thing. And now Francois Giraud uh, will tell us about what we would like to do or, or a little bit of his limited personal view on what we would like to do with that machine. So Francois. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Right, I know I'm standing between uh, you guys and getting back to work after this, so hopefully I won't be too long. Uh, here's an outline. I'll do some general things, uh, uh, specifically introduction to the, the, the physics. Well, this part is like general uh, JLA BIC physics. Uh, this stuff is more specific. Then I'll go into the EIC science case and uh, what I want to, if you take only one message from me, is complementarity between the two programs, right? We, it's not like a JLab will become obsolete. The two machines need one another. So uh, I'm just going to present myself for you to have an idea who I am. Uh, I did my, I completed my PhD in 2006 in France on an experiment that took place here uh, in Holby. And then after that, I became a postdoc there. And then a scientist there. So don't try to do like me. This is a very bad idea. I'm not an example. Uh, I continued working on this exclusive program, uh, DVCS, DVMP. Uh, I'm also, uh, I had a, a proposal on a nuclei, well, specifically helium, because uh, that's a nice scalar target. And uh, just as Doug, I'm very interested in positrons. So uh, that should happen at JLab. And, if it happens at the collider, it's even better. As far as detectors, my expertise were in beamline and calorimeters. Uh, I also worked on the heavy photon search. And uh, two, three years ago, I switched to electron collider. So uh, here's an extensive list of uh, things that you can read. Uh, the beginning here is specifically for the electron ion collider. Uh, the yellow report was definitely the National Academy of Science uh, assessment. Those two I, I really recommend. And uh, down here, I have some uh, personal recommendations. So I, I put them in uh, uh, chronological order, but opposite chronological order. Uh, there are some, uh, like this one, this is kind of the point of view that uh, you don't find in modern text easily. So I would recommend this if you're interested in like historical point of view on this stuff. And uh, one of my favorite book on structure of the nucleons down here. Okay, so general introduction. Uh, you've seen uh, some of these slides. By the way, uh, I have a few slides that I stole from uh, ongoing CNFS CTEC 23 summer school. So uh, full, <laughs> full disclosure here. Uh, so the collider uh, will, so it's going to extend the kinematic reach of what we do at JLab into the gluon dominated uh, regime. Uh, there's a, <laughs> a funny way to put things that was put by, I think, Abbe Deshpande, where he says, when you do collider proton, proton is like uh, smashing two watermelons. So you do a lot of stuff, but you don't get a lot of you know, information. Uh, when you use the advantage of electron, it's like cutting the watermelon with a, with a knife. So you have much more precise information by doing it that way. Uh, polarized nucleon to determine the correlation of C quark and gluon distribution with the nucleon spin. I'll show some of this. Um, heavy ion beams to access the gluon saturation regime as a precise dial to study propagation of color charges in nuclear matter. I'm not going to touch this in my talk. This is not my, era, my uh, area of expertise. So if you want to know more about this, I recommend reading that. And the facility concept at BNL and JLab, reuse of existing significant uh, investment. Uh, and I'd like to include the positron beam in that particular point, but we'll see. Um, okay, I think I should switch this. Uh, I should just like not talk about this because Doug already said, uh, and he, he also said this is kind of a repetition of the same thing, but in different language. So. You saw uh, these kind of plots many times, I think. Uh, what I'm showing here, uh, Q square as a function of X Birkin. So by now you should all know what the, those two variables are. Q square basically gives you the scale of the interaction. 
XPRKN gives you the energy of the active quark uh, dimensionless quantity. Um, what this plot shows is three different uh, square root of S uh, uh, with increasing energy going to the top left over there. And uh, the range in between those two lines, you see this variable Y here is the energy loss of the electron. So Y equal 0 0.95 means that the detected ele electron only has 5% of the incoming electron energy, for instance. So we typically want to be in between those two bands here. Uh, so, so basically what this shows is complementarity of different energy runs. If you want to go deep into the valence region, you probably need to lower the energy. If you really want to study the, the gluon saturation regime, you need to have higher energy. There's a sweet spot in between, as uh, Doug also showed, where actually the luminosity is the highest. And uh, there's a very rich physics program that lives into those different regions. Uh, so JLab is done here. We're doing the transition between non-perturbative regime to the perturbative re uh, regime. Uh, evolution in that direction is the GLAP evolution. Up here, we have saturation, gluon radiation, uh, and evolution in that direction is ERBL. So physics program, position, spin, energy, momentum distributions, the origin of mass, confinement, uh, Carroll symmetry breaking and gravity. I'll say a couple of words about this. As I already said, uh, I'm not gonna talk about jet radio physics or QCD Bram Schreilung, although it's very interesting stuff. And uh, physics of uh, uh, nuclei, nuclear modification, EMC effect, short range correlation. I'm also not touching in this talk. Um, Here's my first uh, physics statement. It's a bit of a strong statement. We have no idea what confinement is. Many people disagree with it, <laughs> that statement. What we do know, and that's one statement for confinement, is that hadrons are singlet under SU3 color. There is never, we don't detect colored particle in our asymptotic state. So that's a simple statement that doesn't get us very far. One of the most popular scenario is the so there are many ways to describe this scenario, linear growth of the static quark anti-quark pair potential or Ariello full of or Wilson loop. I'm not gonna go into this. I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with that stuff. Um, one maybe less known uh, scenario is uh, an idea by Vladimir Gribov. And uh, in order to explain this, I'll take the case of uh, QED. So, you all know this number 137, the electromagnetic uh, Sommerfeld constant. So if you consider the nucleus to be completely point-like, there's no finite size effect. Uh, if you try to stack 137 protons in that nucleus, then what's gonna happen is that the vacuum itself is going to become unstable and you're gonna pull uh, an electron out of the vacuum, a positron is going to escape. So basically what this tells you, and this is calculations that are along like analytical properties of propagator in the infrared. Uh, but the way Gribov put it is that there is an instability of the vacuum above a certain supercritical charge. The vacuum will not allow you to propagate a nucleus that has more than this charge. Now he tried to take into account finite size effects and he came up with this number. I think it was actually 182. But the point is that when he repeats this calculation in QCD, he gets a much smaller number. So he claims that this is the real relevant mechanism for confinement in QCD. And uh, there are obviously other ideas like uh, scenarios uh, you know, uh, on the light front that are inspired by ADS QCD. And in that case, this is a very interesting idea that parallel condensates themselves are confined. And if that's true, that means that this very famous, uh, some people call the biggest blunder when we uh, try to apply the standard model to astrophysics, uh, where, where we get the cosmological constant wrong by over 100 orders of magnitude. If you confine the Carroll condensate, this problem goes away. So it's a very interesting idea, but it's not very popular. Anyway, uh, just to put it into context, if someone in this room is mathematically inclined, there's a million dollar that's waiting for you to solve the mass gap problem. 
and prove that Yang Mills theory exists. Um, I also want to make a short statement here as an opening because some of the observables that I'm most interested in personally, they concern uh, gravitational properties like mass, forces, or angular momentum. So there's a very fundamental way in, in which uh, a graviton can be thought of as a pair of vector bosons. Uh, if you just take ordinary quantum field theory, there's this famous paper by Zwiebern and collaborator in 2010, uh, which is called gravity as the square of the gauge theory. So this is what they call color kinematics duality. This is another way to calculate amplitudes that's not based on Feynman techniques. Uh, and, and they are actually very fast. They, those, are, those methods here are used now in, uh, in modern particle generators because they, can, they allow us to calculate amplitudes much faster than what Feynman was doing. So understanding the deeper origin of these dualities at the heart of string theory, uh, it's also something that is well known. Uh, actually, I forgot to update this in 2018. Uh, this paper had 13,000 citations. I believe this is still the most cited paper in high energy physics. Uh, so anyway, uh, just to say one reason why I personally find uh, energy momentum tensor observable so interesting for QCD is because of those links between gravity and QCD. So let me switch to the EIC science case and may maybe make some much simpler statement on this slide. There's a principle which bears different name uh, depending where you come from. So since I'm French, I'm gonna call it the Fresnel principle. Uh, so you just take a incident wave onto a screen and you wanna calculate what comes out. Well, you just sum over all the elements that make up your screen and you have outgoing uh, spherical wavelets. And if you write this down, uh, so the outgoing uh, amplitude is given by a sum over all the screen here of those spherical waves times the distribution of the screen. So basically, this is just a simple way of understanding why the outgoing amplitude is a Fourier transform of the spatial distribution so this is very old stuff, uh, but uh, it still exists. I have here an example of two pictures that I uh, took from a Nature article on the carbon nanotube imaging, where you see the well the interference pattern on top, the calculated uh, that's just the theory structure for the carbon nanotube and the reconstructed actual image from from the interference imaging. So this is. I mean, we're doing the same thing, just at another scale. And of course, there are some complications that are due to the relativity corrections and so on that I'm not going into here, but essentially this is what we're doing. Uh, a reminder of uh, how this all started, Rutherford scattering got the Nobel Prize in 1908 by sending alpha particles into a gold foil. I hear that this was actually done by his grad students. <laughs> Maybe you know that. So um, uh, yeah, Rutherford uh, scattering formula, he found uh, actually uh, uh, something very close to what we know today. Uh, so historical plots, same thing for now elastic scattering that gave of Shatter the Nobel Prize in 1961. We jumped quite a few years. So you're familiar with this diagram. Uh, Pauli form factor, uh, sorry, direct form factor, Pauli form factor. Uh, same thing, but we, we recast this into magnetic and electric form factors. I'm not going into the details. I assume, I don't know if you've had a talk on elastic scattering, yeah, probably. Anyway, so this is the main plot where we see the data points that lie in between the curve by taking into just uh, taking into account the anomalous magnetic moment or just the MUT. A point particle, the points are right in between, and the best fit 0 0.74, which is close to what we want, but with a larger R bar. So, what we're doing here imaging in transverse impact parameter space. Uh, deeply inelastic scattering now, uh, very different. We come in with a virtual photon, we basically sum over all possible final states. 
this is an incoherent sum uh, over all x. And we use the optical theorem to, to relate this total cross section here to the imaginary part of the Fourier cross section. So that, that's uh, all the theoreticians know this very well. The experimenters may be uh, not so familiar with it, but it's, it's not a real physical process. It's a process in which the initial state and the final state are identical. Okay. Um, so here, the relevant variables, you've seen this, the cross-section depends on x birken and scales as a function of q square, more or less. There are some scaling violations you can see here. That's the discovery of quarks by the MIT group, Slack MIT group, and led to the Nobel Prize in 1990 for Friedman, Kedman, and Taylor. And what we're doing with this stuff is one-dimensional distribution in longitudinal momentum space. Now, the reason I passed this formula here into the optical theorem is if you stare at this for long enough, you can ask yourself, okay, well, what happens if I don't have the same final state now? Uh, well, obviously in that case, you have to measure the final state <laughs> because it's not the same as the initial state. So this is where you come to exclusive scattering. So deeply exclusive scattering, I have two diagrams here. One is when we produce a photon, this is the, so-called golden channel, the cleanest one. Uh, but we also need to measure other processes. here. Uh, I put here vector meson, we can produce a rho, omega phi. So there are several ways of analyzing this. Uh, if you have enough resolution, you may get away with measuring maybe only the proton or maybe only the photon. Typically in large acceptance detector, because our resolution is not so good, we want to measure both to make sure that we really have a clean signal and, and separate it from the rest. So in the Bjorken regime, this process here factorizes the top part, we can calculate using a standard Feynman method. The bottom part is parameterized by those functions, generalized partial distributions, they're defined here. You see again, the same thing as before, it looks a little bit more complicated, but it's exactly the same. There's a Fourier transform. The Fourier transform happens to be along the light cone. And uh, there are some bilocal operators here, and depending what kind of you know spin you put in in the spin operator you put down here, you'll get different combination of GPDs. There's a bunch of them. So here I put uh, in this table here those that conserve helicity. So depending on whether you flip the spin of the quark or you spin you flip the spin of the nucleon, you get more of them. There are other GPDs transversity GPDs, higher twist GPDs, and so on. So it's a whole zoo. Uh, but essentially what we're doing here is three-dimensional imaging, both in transverse impact parameter and longitudinal momentum. And I think there are some experts in this room for this. Uh, so GPD and transverse imaging. This picture here comes from Matthias Burkhardt. Uh, that, that's the physics that contains in the X, Bjorken, and T correlation of those generalized spectral distributions. So Again, we do a Fourier transform of those GPDs at xi equals zero, and we get distribution in transverse impact parameter space as a function of x. Um, here I'm comparing lattice calculation together with uh, initial simple model that was originally published by uh, Matthias Burkhardt. So the features that you need to see, first of all, uh, left right column is u and d so you see the formation of a flavor dipole right so we're looking the virtual photon is incoming into the the slides and we're looking as a function of the impact parameter x y and this suggests this flavor dipole here suggests different uh, angular momentum carried by u and d quarks and the second thing that you notice is between the uh, the top row and the bottom row x increases you see that uh, as the active quark uh, carries almost all the momentum it naturally becomes the the center of the proton so uh, this kind of there's a part that is purely kinematic where uh, those distribution become smaller as as x increases and this has been more or less verified by lattice calculation up to now uh, so just to summarize the content of generalized parton distribution, I put the definition again here. Uh, they contain the same information as uh, the, part, the ordinary parton uh, 
uh, momentum uh, the fraction distributions where initial state is the same as final state. And they also contain information of those form factors, uh, which you can see in the first X moment here. I, is this the zeroth moment or the first moment? I don't know, but it's, it's the first moment in the list. So uh, there's more information in all those moments. So the X and Xi correlations, and that's, so that's the stuff that interests me the most at the moment. Um, we have three form factors that parameterize the energy momentum tensor. So I, I put here the full formulas for energy momentum tensor of uh, species of quark, but you have the same for gluons in the nucleon. So M2, J, and D1, D1 they come with those complicated factors, but uh, the information they contain, so that's the famous G sum rule, angular momentum distribution in the, I guess, second moment, so integral over uh, X dx of the same, the, this sum of H plus E. So you'll notice that, so this is an integral that X xi, right, and uh, integral over x, and it doesn't depend on xi. Now, uh, if we do the integral instead of just h, uh, now we get m2 plus some factor times d1 times xi square. So m2 is going to give you a mass distribution. And here, so I put uh, so the physical content of d1. D1 is Again, related by one of those transform uh, to, let's say here, the pressure. So if you calculate this in the Carroll quark soliton model, you get this type of picture where you get a, a quark core here where the pressure is positive and the pion cloud where the pressure is negative. There is a condition that, so this is R squared times the pressure. The condition of stability here is that the integral of R square times the pressure is zero. And you can, if you think about this long enough, it also has to be positive in the center because if it was attractive in the center, so the outside would blow up and, and the center would just collapse. So it has to look like this somehow, but this comes directly analytically in the Carroll quark soliton model. And I didn't put the reference here, but I have the references if someone's interested. So, okay, so how do we, how do we measure these things? Uh, I, I showed earlier, uh, DVCS process where we produce uh, a photon, so exclusive process. There is another process that contributes to this reaction, the beta hydro process, where the photon is emitted by one of the electron lines before or after. The structure of this process was first uh, analyzed by those author in 97, and then uh, uh, there are two detailed publications, one in 2002 by this group, and uh, some better version came out in 2010. If you want to use this author, use the 2010 publication. But so basically here, I want to ask in as simple fashion as possible, say, well, let's say that we're looking at the beam spin asymmetry. So you flip the spin of the electron here that is done shown in this diagram, and you count the number of events left minus right or right minus left divided by the sum. And at twist two, approximately, I'm making a lot of hand waving statements here because I don't want to show you all the gory details. But this looks like this shape alpha sine phi over one plus beta cosine phi. And this parameter alpha here is going to be mostly sensitive to the imaginary part of H. Now, this H here is not a GPD yet. Uh, it's actually a Compton form factor. And Compton form factor, you can define it like this. So it's the, the imaginary part is the GPD at X equal Xi, and the real part is some integral over X with a kernel. So you see GPDs are not really straightforward to measure. Uh, in general, just to simplify thing, we'll say the beam spin asymmetry is mostly sensitive to H, imaginary part of H. Or here the target longitudinal spin asymmetry is gonna be mostly sensitive to the imaginary part of H tilde. Um, okay, I have tons of details. Um, you see, if we do transverse target asymmetry, then we have a lot more structures depending on this angle phi, trento phi, and uh, uh, the angle of the spin of the target. So you construct those asymmetries. And for instance, here, this 
sine phi s minus phi for a transverse target is going to be mostly sensitive to E. Uh, you can do double spin asymmetry where you flip the spin of the electron and uh, you also flip the spin of the transverse target and you get some other structure. So, and we need to measure all this stuff. If, so it's a, it's a really big, uh, it's a really big plan, but we have to do all this if we really want to extract all this. And um, now, if you paid attention, I only talked about DVCS, but you have to repeat all of this stuff for vector mesons. So, <laughs> if you want to disentangle you and the okay, and here I kind of uh, here for the phi, it should actually show gluons. I mean, there's some strange, but it's mostly gluon, especially for the collider physics. This is totally dominated by gluons. But the point of this table here is just to say, if you really want to measure those GPDs, you need a global analysis of all those reactions. So there's lots of work to be done if you guys want to join. Uh, just a word about gluon. So uh, I talked about phi, uh, but JPSI is uh, even better for, uh, for the collider. So you see, we, we don't know much about uh, gluon GPDs at this point. This is just a, a dummy model. Uh, at the moment, we have extreme scenarios. So it could be that uh, you know you have some power like, or you have some uh, exponential fall off. We we don't know really. Uh, but generally, what we do for our prediction is we take the most uh, pessimistic scenario, and we do prediction with this most pessimistic scenario. So the most rapid fall off as a function of t. And then, you know, if nature appears to be kind to you and it's falling more slowly, then you're lucky. Um, now, I want to, uh, I'm not going to talk about TMDs much in this talk, but there is a unified view of uh, all those functions. I don't know if you had a talk on this, Wigner distributions in this uh, summer school, but I'll just touch a little bit on this. So generally, uh, Wigner distribution, they will give you the most general one parton information you can have. Now, we don't know how to measure this, uh, but depending on the projections you do, so if you, let's say, integrate over the transverse momentum, you're going to get the GPD. And uh, if you instead integrate over the, uh, so yeah, integrate over T or over the uh, impact parameter, then you're, you're going to get TMD information. So I, I think. Those plots here and uh, this graphic was taken by uh, uh, it was taken from this publication by Cedric, uh, where they took just a simple three quark on the light cone picture of the nucleon to to get a simultaneous model of GPD and TMDs. So, in my view, the reason why this is interesting for us is because that would be even next level, right? If you have a simple model for those Wigner functions or generalized TMDs uh, with just parameters to extract, then you fit all the semi-inclusive data, the exclusive data at the same time, and you hope that you get something reasonable. Uh, so obviously that's very long-term program, but potentially the information that you can get would be very rich. Uh, so here I show, for instance, unpolarized quark distribution in unpolarized nucleons, uh, but you have all combinations possible in this article here, but uh, so basically you get quadruple deformation in transverse space, uh, depending on the spin and so on. Um, I have just one slide here to again state that even though I'm not going to show much about TMDs in this, not my area of expertise, but those two are actually uh, complementary in my view. And although there is currently no model independent relation that is known between those two, um, in the framework, at least in principle of Wigner distributions, if you have parameters, you can extract uh, those parameters simultaneously by doing analysis of both some inclusive data and exclusive data. Uh, I'm going to spend just uh, five minutes to show uh, some projection that we have for the class 12 program to kind of give you a sense. Uh, those are, I think you haven't seen those exactly. Sylvia gave a talk, but I think she didn't show those plots exactly. It's, it's the same simulations. So it's the same kind of plot again, Q square as a function of X. Uh, now we did the analysis in bins. 
And you see each of those bins, it has the same vertical scale and it has a T that goes basically from zero to one, minus T. Um, and uh, well, there are many features. First of all, you see the wealth of data that we expect from class 12. Um, I'm only showing class 12 because I was a whole B collaborator, but there are experiments in other holes as well. Uh, you see the fact that those slopes, they change as a function of X. They're related to what I was saying earlier. The fact uh, that uh, when the active quark uh, momentum fraction goes to one, then the active quark defines the center of the nucleon and the, the transverse distribution shrinks. So we can like zoom on one of these. They actually they have actual error bars uh, that comes from the that comes from the projection that we had for the proposal. So we already took some of these data. We're not there yet, of course. The, all the data is not taken yet. This was this was done by using a global analysis of all the data, including transverse target and so on. But I can take one particular slice at fixed Q square here and uh, you know, look at the corresponding transverse profile. So that's what you get. The, the error band here at, uh, at the lowest X value is artificially large is because this bin here is cut. You know, I, I, we just did rectangular bins. So don't pay attention to the fact that this error band is very large. It's just because the bin is not great. But you see uh, the type of precision that we expect just from class 12 data global analysis. And the same thing with uh, now delta Q, so the, uh, when we take into account also H tilde. So one thing I say, <laughs> those are here linear scales. When we're gonna switch now to collider, those are gonna be logarithmical scale. <laughs> um, the thing that interests me the most is this proton pressure. So if you remember the plot that we had earlier with the repulsive core and the attractive uh, force at the periphery. So we did some uh, analysis of global data, uh, the data that we already have uh, in kind of green and the projected impact of the class 12 data in sort of orange or red. And uh, we found uh, well, this pressure at the center of the proton, about 10 times more than the pressure of a neutron star. It's not entirely unexpected, but basically what we expected. So there's no big surprise, but it's just to show that we're making progress towards that thing. So uh, I did some study of say, doing the same thing now, but at the collider. And uh, okay, I'm gonna show some results, but the most important thing is really all on this slide. So you see all the observable that I included, unpolarized cross-section, um, spin asymmetry on the lepton, uh, longitudinal asymmetries, single, double on the, on the nucleon, transverse asymmetries of the nucleon, double, transverse. And I also included uh, positron. I, I'll show with the impact of the positron at the end. Now, uh, there are two components to the uncertainties that I'm gonna show. One of them is from this uh, luminosity here, 100 femto, inverse femtobarn. I'll say a word about this uh, after that. And the other component, the important component is the systematics that we put in. So you see very simple assumption here. I said, okay, let's, let's imagine that we have 70% polarization for everyone. And uh, all asymmetries, they'll have a 3% relative error, okay? A uh, simple assumption to start with. Uh, I apply this 3% also for the charge asymmetry. This may be pessimistic, I'm not sure. This 5% here is the global normalization. This may be optimistic. Doing cross sections with class 12, I gotta admit that this is probably optimistic, but okay, we use that for now. And actually, so one reason I was putting, I didn't wanna be too uh, pessimistic about this number because the bigger this number is, the more weight you put on the positron. You know, if I, if I say I can only measure absolute rate at 15%, then I'm gonna make a statement that the positron is extremely valuable. So I have to, I have to be optimistic if I really wanna be honest about my estimation of what the positron can be. Anyway, uh, 
Doug insisted very much on the luminosity. So I, I have a slide. We, we really care about luminosity here at JLab. You can probably check my calculation here. The number of seconds in a year, uh, I have one third of a billion seconds. Okay, I hope that's correct. Uh, let's say that um, we work with an instant luminosity of 10 to the 34 per centimeter per second. So then, uh, okay, all those numbers, they're just easy to check. A hundred inverse femtobarn will correspond in my estimation to a year at 10 to the 34. And that's with a contingency of factor three. So I, I say, you know, maybe sometimes the detector is off. Maybe sometimes uh, we don't have enough money to run for the whole year. I don't know. But that's the basic idea. Uh, 10 to the 34 is optimistic, especially depending on the energy. If you want to run at low energy, you're probably not going to get that. And OK, I'm just insisting very heavily. <laughs> it's, it transforms into 10 years at 10 to the 33. It's obvious, but it's important. So actually, this is another way to say to see the same thing. Uh, that's the model that I used. Uh, now again, this Q square as a function of X Bjorken. The main change that you see now, those scales are logarithmical scale because we're talking about the EIC. Uh, the vertical scale in my timestamps are all the same, and uh, they extend. You see, like nine orders of magnitude. And for reference, the red line is the same in all of those stamps. So I have, okay, I have this collection of uh, six values of T, but in general, you see that the rate is gonna be very high at low X, but as you wanna push into going into the valence region, you're losing rate quickly. So going into the valence at the collider is gonna be very, very hard. Um, here's the, so by the way, these models, those are for DVCS. This is the lepton spin asymmetry that comes from a global field that was performed by uh, Dieter and Casimir. So basically this team here. So in, in my estimation, that's the best knowledge we have about the VCS at the moment. And we expect to have pretty large uh, asymmetries. You see the scale common to all the stamps is 30%. So very appreciable asymmetries. From the same model, the charge asymmetry now. So if we have a positron beam, as I said, this observable is included in my global fit. And uh, here are, so I'm, I'm not showing all the observable because some of them are small. But basically, T increases from, uh, or minus T increases from top to bottom. And uh, the red line is the, is the model. The blue points are the pseudo data that I have generated at this high energy here. Now, if you pay close attention, you'll notice that uh, the blue points, for instance, here for the cross section, they're below. That's because I included systematics in this exercise. So here is maybe a, a, a zoom to see that better. You see the red is not a fit. The red is the model and the blue points are below because I included some systematics in my reconstruction. Also, the binning is not the same for all observables. There are some observables that are, uh, they are smaller. So the binning is more sparse for those. And uh, here is a terrible way of showing the result of this work. Uh, I'll have another way to show it later. So this is just the Compton form factor imaginary part of H as a function of T for all of those x Bjorken bins, uh, H tilde E. And yeah, you, you cannot see anything. So on the bottom instead, and the label is wrong here, it's for the imaginary part. Uh, the same thing, but the relative error. So basically you see that for most of the kinematic range, we are able to extract Imaginary part of H quite well. Imaginary part of H tilde, not well at all. It's basically completely unknown. And E, we can extract. And the same thing for the real part. The real part is harder. So in general, it's kind of the same message. You're not, with this exercise here, you're not getting H tilde, but you are getting some sensitivity to H and E in this slide, the real part. And uh, this is a better way to see the same thing. Um, 
but I just those bands here are interpolated because this is local fits. So I'm just interpolating between those uh, local bins. And uh, well, you see two scenarios. There, the scenario at high energy that I just showed, it has uh, so it extends at lower x. And uh, if you go to lower energy, then you can push to higher x values. Now there's a better strategy than what I'm showing here, which is instead of doing fits in timestamps, the way I did it is to do a global fit. So I use, in that case, I can use the dispersion relation. So the, let's say the real part, for instance, is parameterized from a imaginary part and a subtraction constant. And the, the reason why, well, first of all, it's a parameterization, but second of all, the subtraction constant is the same for H and E, and there's no subtraction constant for H tilde and E tilde. So not only you have only few parameters to extract, but also you limit the number of parameters with this technique. Um, so at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned G sum rule. Uh, this is something that everybody wants to measure. So we want to do the integral of this sum H plus E, but, uh, you know, at fixed psi. And unfortunately, that's not what DVCS does. DVCS is going to measure at x equal psi. So you have to do some interpolation. Let's say, how do you go from whatever value of psi you have to psi equals zero? So that's a function that has been dubbed the skewness function, h of x equal psi divided by h of x and psi equals zero. And the idea here is, okay, uh, we measure x, we x equal psi function using DVCS, and we measure this other function using another process. Which other process? Well, as you can see, so this QNS function, when you define it that way, the interest is that it kind of becomes trivial at psi equals zero. So for low x, it becomes one, uh, but it changes very rapidly. That's a model calculation. It changes very rapidly at large x. So basically what I'm saying here is we measure something like double DVCS. So where the final state photon is also virtual and produces a pair, uh, but we don't do that at the collider because we don't have the luminosity for that. So we do that at, at JLM. And I think this is basically my last slide. I just want to mention the fact that, uh, yeah, so I assume that I had a positron beam. I love positron, Doug love positrons also. What if I don't have a positron? So you see the, the impact here is, is gonna mostly blow up my uncertainties on the real part. So that's well expected, but, but it's a pretty significant impact. And again, um, let me state, in order to get that error band here, I've made some very strong assumption on the luminosity and the systematics. It's not gonna be better than this. <laughs> so there is definitely some value for the positron. And that's just one aspect of physics. I mean, you can do a whole bunch of stuff with positrons. Um, yeah, so just flashing some slides for trying to propagate uncertainties to impact on the dispersion relations. And again, you see the, with those pretty strong assumption on the, on the luminosity, the value of the low energy data versus the high energy data, the low energy data really allows us to push into the large x Bjorken region. And since this analysis re, re, relies on dispersion where you do an integral over X, uh, the low energy data is very valuable. Uh, yeah, this is actually my last slide. Okay, so, so far I've, I've been talking about essentially one part on information, but there's not just one part on, there's more than one part on in the nucleon and uh, there's evidence for multi-part on interaction. That was first suggested way back. Uh, here's some evidence, uh, uh, a list of evidence. Uh, so it was found to be necessary to tune Pitya and Herwig uh, to basically uh, be able to both data from, from CERN, from CDS, uh, CDF, CFT, CMS, uh, underlying uh, digit events, and so on, Drelian. And uh, so that's expected to be a pretty significant challenge for LHC. 
so basically the idea, you know, I, I was talking about the fact that at high X, the, nu the nu nucleon shrinks. If you have uh, active, your active proton carries all the momentum, then by definition is the center. But now if you have two partons that both have a significant momentum, then, you know, if you don't take this change in impact parameter into account, then you assume that you have a big nucleon, then no, it's, it's actually much smaller. So those are distributions like this, instead of having one active proton, you have two. Anyway, so that's, a, that's another thing that uh, uh, these studies can be impactful for LHC studies. So I try to you know, show you, or in a very short amount of time, that there is a unified framework for nucleon tomography. I didn't go into details, but I can just say by words that the first data from the uh, 6GV era, they showed us uh, precocious dominance for small configurations. So evidence or hints that we're already reaching scaling. Well, of course, we need to do a lot more work to be sure of this. In the 12G era, 12 GV era, we're going to have much more accurate data in the in the valence region and moderate momentum transfer, and all of this naturally extends uh, to the collider. There's an interplay between spin and flavor decompositions, uh, as I said. So I was just talking about GPDs, or mostly about GPDs. You saw the entire zoo. You have to you have to analyze all these reactions simultaneously if you are serious about extracting those quantities. And uh, so the collider will expand. Uh, our reach into the, the C and gluon. There are other measurements that are still planned at uh, Compass, uh, Desi Panda. So this is not uh, just uh, JLab and the Collider, but our work will be essential for really understanding QCD background at the LHC and beyond. I mean, the, I, I hope I made it clear that the phys our physics is interesting, but it also has impact for other people. And again, I want to repeat, uh, if you take only one thing away from my talk, is complementarity between all these programs. Thank you. Uh, so I think it was slide nine when you mentioned the gravity as a square of a gauge theory. Is that just in the context of um, graviton would be spin two and two photons would then be project out the other? Uh, zero projection and things like that uh, you can you could trick nature into thinking instead of scattering with a graviton you're scattering these two photons is, yeah, is yeah. that the I limitation mean, uh, of that this is exactly one way to understand uh where is that diagram here so one way to understand how in these processes we are sensitive to gravitational observables is that you have two spin one that come in so that gives you the same information as one spin two so that's definitely one way to understand this. There's a lot more than just this. It goes deeper. It's not just kinematics. Um, so here, the kinematic part is basically here. So here you're just doing, you're just doing regular uh, quantum field theory. And uh, Bern and collaborators here, they're, they're not doing the calculations the same way Fenman taught us, okay? They're doing completely other, they're using twisters or so on. And their calculations are very fast. I mean, I can give you more reference if you're interested into this, but the upshot is you're able, first of all, you're able to make calculations very fast that are used in generators like Herwig and so on. This is based on those ideas. And second of all, you, you show that uh, um, gravitational amplitudes, they emerge from uh, uh, the square of gauge theory, which exactly the same as what you were saying. But it goes beyond this. I mean, uh, uh, when you do string theory, uh, you know, uh, a graviton is a, is a closed string, uh, whereas a vector boson is an open string, uh, but goes into the holographic principle where you have duality between um, gravity in the bulk and uh, a gauge theory uh, on the boundary. So I, I know there's a lot of, you know, hand waving here because this paper here is only valid when you have some specific maximally supersymmetric theory. But I mean, we, we have concrete models uh, from people like Brodsky where he fits everything uh, with just two parameters, right? And those are based on the same ideas. Now, this may not be mathematically established, but it's a very interesting thing. Um, yeah, there are other things. I, I don't want to say too much about this. We can talk about this another time. 
Hello? Yeah, I have uh, some comment about the gauge gravity duality. No matter, uh, based on what he said, that uh, a gravity is a gauge theory squared, yeah, no matter that is what they do, but there's uh, some problems. For example, uh, there's a problem with uh, the weinberg witten theorem that says that uh, it cannot be done, but uh, they do that just uh, classically. But in quantum theory theory, that theorem pro, uh, uh, doesn't allow that to, do, to think that uh, a graviton is just a, a boundary state of a photon. So they showed that it cannot be done. Uh, normally, there is even a professor at UCLA who invented something like uh, which is called double coffee. Is a version of a gauge gravity duality. So I had a discussion with him, and I criticized we, I criticized him based on that, uh, based on that theorem. So he was angry, but he could not answer my question because that theorem says that it cannot be done in QFT. Another, there's also another problem. Uh, QCD normally is a. Uh, uh, Based on ADS CFT, um, QCD is not exactly conformal. Mm -hmm. Is approximately conformal, so that people think that uh, maybe the application of ADS CFT may lead to some problems. You know, I'll say this. Uh, I love mathematics myself. Like, I do it for pleasure. And uh, historically, Wolfgang Pauli was one physicist who was a really good mathematician. And people would come and make presentations and, you know, Hulenbeck and Gutschmidt. They're like, oh, we had this idea that spin and so on. And Pauli is like, no, this is wrong because I have a theorem. You can't escape it because it's mathematics. And then it happened over and over again. I don't remember if it was Yang or Mills. One of them gave a presentation years later saying, you know, what if instead of doing just abelian symmetry, we do non abelian symmetry? And Pauli gets up and is like, What, you think I didn't think of this 30 years ago? Where are all those vector bosons flying around? <laughs> so, mathematics is great. I love it. It's not physics. We're doing speculation here. It's, it's not mathematics, it's physics. Consider that uh, it graviton is a boundary state of the foot. Yeah, I think we can talk. Most of the audience is not interested in this, then, but I'll be happy to talk to you more about it. Okay, then we have like two possibilities a, a spin two and a spin zero, which is the mass. Yeah, I can talk to you in more details about my idea how you escape those so called no go theorems. Well, I have a question actually. Uh, going back to your one of your last of the se your last several slides uh, on, on the multi, uh, multi part distributions. Yeah. How do you probe this uh, with a photon? So at, at the electron ion collider? Oh, no, no, no. We don't, I'm not saying we probe this directly. Uh -huh. I'm saying the simplest way to model this is by using this information from single parton and the, the transverse impact parameter picture. So you just do product of GPDs and you know there's more than this. Maybe there's not more than this actually. But the simplest way to take these effects into account is, you know, just at least take into account the information you learn from GPD physics. Okay, because I was thinking that since now we go a, a smallish x, then you can take a photon, the photon splits into a QQ bar, and this QQ bar can actually have two collisions okay. against your left hand object. So maybe there is a way of doing that. At the yeah, maybe we should think about it. Here's a proposal. <laughs> but yeah the statement here at this level and that's not it comes from these authors i think uh was that you need to the simplest way to take this into account is just a product of gpd okay then we can thank francois again <laughs>